Yeah. Getting pumped up today for a little session. A little right said Fred here, a little soccer anthem. Are you a champion today? Are you playing like a champion today? Are you dialing like a champion today? Or are you just going through the paces, man? Are you motivated? Are you hot? Are you ready? Are you ready to help people today? Are you helping people or are you just going through the motions? Are you looking for people to help? Are you dialing like a champion? Well, how is everybody doing today? Glad to have you here. Glad uh, everything is uh, beautiful for you where you're at. I hope everything is fantastic. I'll tell you what, we need about uh, 15, 20 seconds, maybe 45 seconds, and we're going to get started. Got a great video for you guys, and um, we'll be ready to go. I got to get rid of this echo, and I'll be right back. All right, I think I killed that echo. Fantastic. Um, hey, I'm uh, I'm Mark Benefield. Um, I know some of you guys are expecting Adam, but uh, every once in a while, Adam and I we switch it up a little bit. Uh, some of you may have heard my name. I may have even uh, been the account manager working with you, getting into this program, or I was working with your uh, your owner or rainmaker um, or your team. We're glad you're here. Um, Got uh, got some cool stuff for you today. Like I said, every once in a while, Adam and I we switch it up a little bit, and um, I come in and I uh, I do some some more specific sales related training. Um, and today we're going to be talking about questioning, um, specifically how do we get our questions asked, how do we get our questions answered, how do we understand and get in between the lines of the script. Um, you've probably heard Adam say, you've probably heard me say, we don't like scripts, we don't like the term scripts. I really don't like the term script. Um, I realize in real estate we have to use that term because that's what everybody's familiar with. I prefer to think of it as a word outline or a call outline, a call track, um, bullet points, um, because I think once we become scripted, we stop listening. And here is the problem with a script. Prospects don't follow script, man. They don't follow our script. And if we are so arrogant to think that we have all the answers and we've heard it all before and there's nothing unique about this person's situation that we might be able to help them with, at that point, we're, I don't even know, I don't even know what we're, why we're here. Um, I'm not a robot. I don't expect you to be a robot. I don't expect you to be scripted to the point where you don't listen to people. I've been, I belong to all kinds of Facebook groups. I belong to all kinds of uh, um, different things where people kind of chat back and forth. And all the time I'm seeing people, well, what should I say in this circumstance? What should I say in that circumstance? What's my script for this? What's my script for that? And the reality is, is that um, you shouldn't have a script. You should learn some basic techniques that allow you to be able to deal with anything that comes at you, anything that comes in your direction. You should be able to do that. So let's hop right into our, uh, our, uh, our presentation for today, um, our class session for the day. Um, Hopefully, it'll be a good one for you guys. Um, like I mentioned, today's class session is called How Many Layers Does an Onion Have? Or How Do You Get Your Questions Asked and Answered? Because let's face it, sales is all about asking questions. It's not about telling people. Sometimes maybe you've heard that, that saying before, telling is, is not selling. 
or selling is not telling. It's about how do I get good questions asked? I have a sign that sits outside my door and it said in the office and it says, how do you sell? Do you sell like a doctor? I mean, when a doctor walks in, you walk into a doctor's office. He doesn't walk in and say, hey, it looks like your knee hurts. Let me uh, let me write your prescription. No, he says, what happened to your knee? You say, well, I heard it. He goes, well, tell me more about that. And he said, well, what were you doing? Well, I was playing soccer. Okay, were you running or did you get kicked? No, I was running. Okay, did you? were you pivoting? Were you going left and right? And he gets his hands down there and he feels around and he digs into it. He says, does it hurt here? Does it hurt there? Right? He doesn't come in and just tell you what he's going to do because he's had six weeks of training, <laughs> you know, like, like real estate agents. No, he comes in and he asks good, solid questions so he can diagnose the proper um, problem and then give the proper medication. Right, that's who we need to be. So let's take a look at our uh, our um, our program here. Um, first things up is a uh, little uh, little um, video. You see, folks, um, as a little boxer, and it says that you never lose. You either 
um, win or you learn. And uh, I know there's some people on this call today, man, who um, you know maybe you're struggling a little bit. You're new to this ISA game or you've been in the game for a while. And um, and it's hard, man. We know it's hard. You know how we know it's hard is because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of real estate agents trying to find an ISA, trying to do the very thing that they can't do. They're trying to find somebody to do the very thing that they're not willing to do. They're trying to find an ISA who, who quite frankly, is better at it than they are. Now, some of you work for uh, some tremendous rainmakers, people that are very successful. And that might not be the case with them, but I can tell you, because I talk to these people every day. There's people who can't make cold calls. There's people who can't follow up on leads. They are scared to death and they want to find someone who can do it for them. And they pay us a tremendous amount of money to help train people. And we, we actually have ISAs that we have trained and we sell um, their services out on the open market because there's people out there that are too scared to do to try to do what you guys do every day what you guys do is vitally important but it's also vitally important that we get better at what we do and how we do it typically when i do a session um if you're ever on the the afternoon advanced sessions with me or you've been on one of those sessions before i usually start out most of all my sessions just this way we talk about victories we talk about great things that happened in the previous week um uh, we talk about uh um um, sales that were made. We talk about appointments that were set. We talk about personal victories, things that you overcame. I mean, some of you right now um, were on the call last week and weren't even sure that you'd be on the call this week, but you're here and you overcame. You overcame your, your fear and you overcame um, that that uh, that feeling that you had that you weren't sure maybe if you were the right person for the job. Um, we've had a lot of great victories around our office today. Um, I was talking to a, a gentleman today. Um, he sold his first house today. What a, what a victory for that guy. And he's been working. He's working hard. Um, I was listening in on some prospecting calls today and one of our agents. And uh, they had a uh, – um, I was just listening. And afterwards, I said, dude, you are doing fantastic. Brand new. He's a new agent. Been around a couple of months. But he is really – he was making an internet call. He was calling on an internet lead. Uh, much like some of you might do. It was a boomtown lead. And he just sound, he had a, a, he had a confidence in his voice. He had, a, you know, an assertive tone. He wasn't aggressive, but he was leading the call. He was saying, you know, look, this is what I think we should do. How about we do this? You know, I think our next step should be here. You know, this is what we ought to do after that. And he was leading. And these are all victories. And so I'm just curious. We don't have time today to kind of go over individual victories and call victories out from you, but I often do that. I want you to think to yourself, what did I do well today? What did I learn? Because every time you learn something, it's a victory. And so I hope at the end of this session today, when we get to the end, you're going to say to yourself, you know what? Victory, because I just learned a few things. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop some stuff on you today that uh, hopefully you're going to learn um, and you're going to learn well, and it's going to serve you throughout the time that you're in the role that you're in now and probably off in other parts of your life as well. Um, we're going to talk about the elements of communication first. You see, um, I don't know about you, but when I look at this graph here, um, the first thing that jumps, what is the first thing that jumps out at you? I know the first time I saw it, what jumped out at me was 55% uh, of element of communication, meaning what people remember after a communication event is tonality, or pardon me, it's body language. But here's the problem. On the phone, people can't see you. You see, 55% of, of, of communication is body language. What's the smallest percentage? 7%. 7% of what people actually remember after a communication interaction is not what you said. It's how you sounded at 38% and what you looked like. The problem is when you're on the phone, people can't see you. So when you're on the phone, body language goes away, and now the breakdown is this. 73% of what people remember after a communication interaction with you as an ISA on the phone is how you sound. Yet we spend all our time on what to say, on practicing my script, 
and memorizing my script and knowing every objection and every answer to every objection. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. My mom had no idea she was going to be a sales trainer when I grew up. Yes, that's what I just said. My mom had no idea she was going to be a sales trainer when I grew up. Because you know what? When I was seven years old, when I was eight years old, when I was 12, and when I was 14, when I was 16, I used to hear from my mom all the time. All, all the time. And she would say, Mark, it's not what you said. It's how you said it. See, what I didn't understand back then was it wasn't the words I was using. It was the tone I was using, the nasty tone, the derisive tone, the um, disrespectful tone. And, and she knew what I meant, not by what I said, but how I said it. And it took a long time for that to sink into me. It took a long time for me to get to where I understood how that applied to me in the sales world. I'm not saying not knowing your opening line is not important. I'm not saying understanding which questions and which in, in what kind of order is not important. I'm not saying that learning good closing um, um, paragraphs, good closing lines are not important. What I'm saying is you should spend more time thinking about how you sound, how you carry yourself with your voice. You need to understand your pitch. You need to understand your speed. You need to understand if you speak with clarity. You need, you need to understand if you use the top type of pausing. I, some of you may have already noticed, one, I talk very fast, naturally. Two, I uh, sometimes I'm not always that clear. My words get jumbled sometimes because I'm talking too fast. But we have to recognize our tonality and its impact on the call. We're going to watch a video here in a moment, and you're going to hear him talk about tonality, and you're going to talk about um, positive tonality and negative tonality and how voice inflections uh, put us in a subservient role. I believe in peer-to-peer um, -peer communication. I believe in executive-to-executive um, -executive communication. You are a sales executive. You're simply on the phone. You're a phone sales executive, and you are calling Owners. I believe in owner to owner conversations. You're the owner of your business. If you're an agent on here, you're the owner of your day. If you're an ISA on here and you're calling an owner of a house, owners talk to owners different than employees talk to owners. Right. When if you had a CEO call another CEO, their conversation would sound different than if, let's face it, you call a CEO. Right. When you call a CEO as an ISA, you're going to say something or a homeowner. But in this case, we're talking about business. OK, just say you were on the phone and you were calling an owner to sell them a website. You would say something like, um, you know, may I speak with uh, you know, Bill Williams. You'd probably say Mr. Williams. Right. You say, hey, can I speak with Mr. Williams? And he'd say, Mr. Williams. Hi, this is Mark Benefield and I'm the uh, sales executive over XYZ Corporation. And I'd like to take the t opportunity today to tell you how we've been able to increase people's revenue 25 percent in as little as six months just by tweaking a few small things on our website. Now, you would certainly want to hear about that, wouldn't you, sir? And he would be like, no, <laughs> because it's a subservient conversation. When an owner calls an owner, if the owner of the website company calls the owner of, of this other company, this is what it sounds like. He says, ring, ring, ring. He says, Bill. And the guy says, yeah. See, he uses his first name, right? Because they're peers. He says, Bill, Mark Benefield over at XYZ. Hey, I heard you've been having a little trouble with your websites lately. I think we have a solution there for you. We've been able to help a lot of people really grow their business, sometimes as much as 25%. When's a good time you and I can have lunch? I can sit down and we can talk about how we might be able to help you. Different sounding conversation, isn't it? Because that's an owner talking to an owner. What I want you to start thinking about is you are an owner. You're a CEO. I want you to act. I want you to think like an owner of a company, not as a subservient person. I want you to carry the tone of somebody who, quite frankly, is um, 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 has a stature of respect. I want you to carry the stature of respect throughout your conversation. It doesn't mean you're demeaning. It doesn't mean you talk down to people. It doesn't mean you talk over people. It means you have a mutual respect for that person. And you have respect for yourself. 
So let's take a quick listen to this uh, this next video. This uh, gentleman talks a little bit about uh, tonality. Hello. Today I want to talk to you about what may be the most important aspect of nonverbal and verbal communication. It stems from every single word that you say. You have no choice but to express yourself with a certain tonality. Tonality is so powerful. Think about the days when you were a young kid and your parents said, don't use that tone of voice with me, young man. It's so impacting. It oftentimes carries more weight than the actual words that you use. The very important thing to remember is regardless of whether you think you're using a certain tonality or not, everything you say is said with the tonality. I think most of the time people think they're using a tonality that is very neutral and it kind of maintains the current vibe or the current energy of the interaction while they don't really realize they're coming from a little bit different perspective than what they think. Now, the three different types of tonality are rapport breaking, neutral, and rapport seeking. So think about rapport seeking for a minute. Think about you're talking to a boss or you're at an interview. Most of the time, the inflection of your voice towards the end of the sentence is going to go up. So do something easy with how are you doing. So you're going to say something like, how are you doing? Very supplicating, once again, very looking for approval, um, trying not to ruffle any feathers, trying not to give them any reason to feel anything except for you're going to be friendly for them. How are you today? How are you doing? It sounds like a sales call almost. How's your week been? Very high pitch. Actually, when you think about it more, the entire tone sometimes is high pitch with inflection at the end. So how are you? Very high level the whole time, almost like you're singing a little bit. When you listen to it and you see people interacting and you hear that tone, it's, it's actually kind of hard to listen to because you realize the other person is, is brown nosing. It's just it's almost kind of offensive. But the problem is too many people use that tone at the beginning of the interaction thinking that's the best way to come across because, once again, you're not ruffling any feathers. You're meeting someone new. You want them to like you, don't you? Yes, but you also want them to respect you. Okay, so now you can speak with a neutral tonality. So now you're talking like I'm talking right now. How are you? You know, it's not going, it's not too high. You're not singing. You're not in your head voice, um, but you're not also coming down. You're not breaking rapport either. So how are you? How was your week? How's everything been going with you? How are the kids? Anything like that is very neutral. It's going to kind of maintain the energy you put forth, unless, of course, you're coming from this rapport-seeking tonality that I started with. And lastly, you've got what's called rapport-breaking tonality. So that typically is going to trail off with a lowering in the tone of your voice. So how does this come across when I say this? How are you? How was your week? Oh, yeah, how's the wife been? It sounds like a boss speaking to a, a coworker or a employee, doesn't it? It's actually the most powerful type of tonality because it indicates that you're not worried about ruffling feathers. You're comfortable the way you're perceived. And it's very strange because there's nothing specifically about that type of tonality that intuitively tells you that he's trying to repray rapport or that he's not worried about how he comes across, but it's so easy to identify. I mean, you could take anyone off the street and show them me saying these three things and say, guess who he's interacting with? Is he worried about how he's perceived? Does he put the person he's talking to status above him? I would guess that a 10-year-old kid oftentimes would get everything correct because it's such a crux of human interaction and human communication. So when I talk about the communication equilibrium, you can think of it as a seesaw, as a balance, as I always talk about, or you can just think of it, are you interacting with someone who's cooler than you or not? Um, I mean, I heard many years ago, uh, the world is a big high school. Cool people stay cool and dorks stay dorks. Well, that's not true. People obviously change, but there is always a perception where people are trying to scan out your social value or are you cool or not. So pretty much when I say if you're slipping in the scale, just think of it as does a person you talk to all of a sudden, all of a sudden think you're a little less cool? Do they think they're a little cooler than you? Are they putting you below them? Are you putting them on a pedestal. When that happens, I'm referring to when the equilibrium shifts against you, you're at 40, they're at 60. So that's another way to kind of conceptualize this premise. So say you're approaching the quarterback of the team and you don't play football and you're trying to come across in a really good light, you're going to feel when you're interacting to them very stifled. You're going to feel like you can't be yourself, like you're trying to put on a good impression because you know what they think of you can have an impact on your life. All of a sudden, it's the end of a football game, and he's walking out, and he's like, oh, hey, 
how are you doing, man? How would you think of the game? And everyone sees that. Well, they're going to think, wow, this guy, this guy must be cool. The coolest guy in school is giving him props. That's very important to think about. So you're going to come at it with a very rapport-seeking tonality. And the problem is what you're trying to do is actually the opposite of what you're going to achieve. You want him to like you. Instead, you're going to come across as someone that doesn't respect themselves, therefore doesn't think that the quarterback should respect him, and odds are the quarterback won't respect him and won't like him. So it's very important when you're going up to someone who it's very important to you what they think of you, watch that tonality. Now let's use this in a business setting. You're talking to your boss. I coach people all the time who say, how should I interact with my boss? I feel like they don't respect me. They talk down to me. Well, I say, well, let's pretend we're interacting right now. And 99% of the time, they're using a very supplicating, rapport-seeking, oh, please like me, throw me a bone, put me on mentality. Whereas I don't coach them to say, you know, come at it with a rapport-breaking tonality. Try a neutral tonality. And the surprising thing is when you're using a neutral tonality with someone who you perceive as higher value to you, you will feel like you're talking with a very rapport-breaking tonality because you're so used to supplicating and so used to putting them on a pedestal. So even if you start to speak with them like, yeah, how was your week? Was everything good? A very on the same page as the other person, you'll feel like you're saying, how was your week? How are things with your wife? But in actuality, that's your perception. That's not what's really going on. So if you're in a situation like this, and most people are, that they have someone that's very important how they perceive them, whether because of work or for personal reasons, watch your tonality and try to come at them with a much more rapport neutral tone as opposed to rapport seeking. Basically what tonality is telling people in a non drool Very uh, interesting thoughts on uh, on tonality there. Um, you know, talking about those uh, those neutral um, conversations, those that neutral tonality, and and being so uh, vastly important. Um, and it's really the the term I was using um, earlier about. Um, um, peer to peer or CEO to CEO, or president to president. It's really what we're talking about is that neutral tonality where um, I am, for lack of better terms, um, matching, uh, mirroring what, um, what I'm getting from the other person. But it's more about, about leading the conversation than it is about that. <clears throat> um, there's a second piece of being able to get your questions asked and answered. Of course, the first is the tonality, how you sound. But the second thing is a thing that called softening and reversing. Um, on the right there, you see a, a graphic of a house. And for those of you who haven't seen that before, that's what we call the select homes um, um um, house or selling house or process. You may also hear it referred to as lion selling. It's nothing more than a graphic representation of the process that we take people through um, in order um, for, to, for a sale to be made. And when I say a sale, in this case, for us, I mean an appointment. We take people through a process from the time that we talk to them, the way that we create the report through our tonality and our, our peer to peer, our neutral tonality, um, through a process of mutual agreement to where we find what their true motivation is, find out what their pain is, their pleasure points, their emotional connection to the problem. And then we figure out what it's going to take for them to make a decision to be able to decide to meet with us. Right. And excuse me. Part of that as we take people through that process, there's a very specific set of, of things that we need to utilize. You see those ladders in between the floors? And I want you to think of the questioning or your questioning process 
as the ladders in between these floors. Um, because it's through questioning that we find out what we need to know. So here's, a, here's another problem that I have with blindly learning and memorizing scripts. It does not leave room for questioning. Some of us will learn some, there's some fantastic techniques out there. One that uh, comes to mind um, is uh, LP Mama. Um, and Bob Corcoran is uh, big on, on that and teaches that. Um, it's a fantastic technique uh, for you to be able to remember the types of questions that you need to ask, location, price, motivation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All fantastic questions. Although I don't think so, and I hope so, that those questions were never meant to be asked specifically in that order without digging any deeper than simply asking what location would you like to move to. You see, asking somebody the location they want to move to, and they say, well, I want to move to East Las Vegas. If you don't follow that up with another question, you're just a flat amateur. If you move straight from you want to move to Las Vegas, oh, I see. So what price range are you looking in? You're a flat amateur. If you don't stop and ask some additional questions about why East Las Vegas, why there? What do you like about that? <laughs> what draws you to that neighborhood? Why is that part of town important to you? Is it closer to your work? Is it closer to your family? If you don't understand the real reasons, then you're an amateur. Let's face it. I don't care if you've been on here for 10 years. If that's all you do, you're still an amateur. We need to learn how to soften and we need to learn how to reverse. Um, reversing. You know that, that annoying habit that salespeople have um, because they always answer a question with a question, that's actually what reversing is. Reversing is nothing more than asking a question, answering a question with another question, right? But you hate it when salespeople do that, don't you? You ask them something like, um, well, how much is that? And they say, well, let me ask you a question. You hate it when they do that. And you know why you hate it? Do you know why? It's because they suck at it. They have no skill. They have no nuance. They don't have 10 years of sales experience. They have one year of experience 10 times over. They're not professionals. They're just long-term amateurs. You see, I meet people every day. I meet salespeople, sales professionals, real estate agents, ISAs. Um, in previous life, deal with corporate salespeople, business-to-business salespeople, small business specialists, uh, medium business specialists, on, um, enterprise selling specialists, um, account executives, account managers, you name it. And all they ever want to say is, well, I've been, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been doing this for 20 years. And the problem is they're still using the same techniques that they learned when they were one year in the business. See, there's a thing out there called the dummy curve. And what most people don't understand is they're actually in the middle of the dummy curve. You see, over here on the left side is when the dummy phase, and that's when somebody is new. Some of you right now are brand new ISAs, and you are in the dummy phase. And I'm going to tell you, you know what? Good for you. That's exactly where you should be when you're new. Everybody's there. When I came into this business, I was in the dummy phase. When Adam came into the business, he was in the dummy phase. When your agents came into the business, the guys that you work for came into it. They were in a dummy phase. That's okay. The dummy phase basically just means is a recognition <clears throat> that you don't know everything there is to know. Right? And that's fair. And so what do you do when you're new in the business and you don't know everything? You tell people, well, I don't know the answer to that. If, if you're authentic and you say, you know what, though, I'm going to find the answer and I'm going to get back to you. And so since you don't know everything, you don't have a pitch yet. You don't know the whys and the how fors, and you don't know all of the market statistics, and you don't know the 93-point marketing plan, and you don't know the unique selling propositions. And so you have to ask lots of questions. You have to say, well, hey, I'm sorry. I'm not really sure what you mean by that. You know, could you help me with that? And you have to say things like, um, you know, I'm not sure. You know, can, can I clarify that with you? When you said this, do you mean that? Right. And so you're forced to ask questions. And so what happens is you actually make some money. You're actually up here on this uh, axis 
being zero down here and a thousand up here, you actually make some money because you're being authentic and you ask questions. Well, then something really interesting happens in the sales world. Sometimes, see the old guys who don't understand this, they call that beginner's luck. So you go out there and you get yourself a few appointments and, you know, um, um, Robbie real estate dude walks by and, and you say, man, I just got two appointments. He goes, good for you, man. Beginner's luck. Everybody gets some, gets a few right away. Well, he doesn't understand that what you were doing was you being authentic and you were asking questions. And that's what led you to getting those appointments. And see what happens is it's not blind luck. It's the process you were using. You were listening and asking. And what happens is people start to get training and they go to this training, they go to that coaching and they, they learn a 93 point marketing plan and they learn the statistics. And they learn the real trends. And they learn what buyer's market means and they learn what the seller's market means. And they, and they learn all this great stuff and they learn, you know, the 93 point marketing plan. They learn all this stuff. And what happens is now they're trained killers. They know everything there is to know. They have an answer for every objection. They have just now become amateurs. When I hear people that pride themselves on being, having objection handler after objection handler after objection handler, and they handle it and handle it and handle it, you know what? They have become amateurs. And they think, they think they're professionals. What they've done is they've learned everything they ever knew in one year, and they just kept doing it over and over and over. And you know what? Amateurs make some money. Sometimes amateurs get really, really, really good at being an amateur. And so they rise to the top of the amateur phase and they make a decent living. But what they don't realize is if they change some very basic things about the way they're doing business, they would actually grow in the professional phase. See, a professional phase has nothing to do with how long you've been in the business. It has to do with your technique. And see, what I want you to do, and I want you to learn how to do, is I want you to get out of this amateur phase where you're talking all the time, not listening, handling every objection. And I want you to move into the professional phase where you're back to doing what you did when you were a dummy, but now you do it on purpose. You listen. You reverse. You ask good questions, you're authentic, you clarify, you don't pretend you know things when you don't know them, you become real and you come and you ask great questions because you're going to learn to get better questions. You're going to learn softening techniques, you're going to learn reversing techniques, you're going to learn iceberg techniques, and you're going to learn transactional analysis, and you're going to learn all these different things you're going to learn in this program. In this foundation program, then after that, when you're in an advanced program, and you're becoming a professional, and I don't care if you've been in business for nine months or you've been in business for 15 years, the person who's been in business for nine months can quite frankly sell more and can sell more appointments if they learn to be a professional, if they learn to talk less, listen more, and ask really good questions. But there's a technique and there's an understanding of how to ask good questions. And here is part of what it is. To not be annoying and simply reverse and answer questions with questions, you need to learn how to use softening statements and reversing questions. You can't just simply reverse. If somebody walks up to you and they say, um, why did you put that pair of shoes on today? And you said, and you say, why are you asking me that? Bad tonality, bad technique. What you could say is, Hey, you know what? That's a good observation. Um, I'm just curious. What made you take notice of my shoes? Right. And now I get more information. I get to, I get some insight as to what they liked about them, what they didn't like about them. Um, I'll give you a great I'll give you a great example of a a question that customers of mine used to get asked and how they would answer it. And then screw themselves by answering a question when they didn't understand the impact. You see, as a sales professional, our job is to gather information. It's okay to answer someone's question if you understand the impact of the answer that you're giving. You have to understand the question and understand the potential impact of your answer. So here's the, here's the situation. Um, I used to own a sales training and consulting company. One of my customers was a group of uh, radio stations. 
And this radio stations were owned by a guy named, um, well, I won't use his name, but it's, let's just say his name was Bill Williams. And uh, Bill Williams is a, a guy here in Wichita, fake name, right? But there's a real guy. And let's just say Bill Williams is very well known here in Wichita. Um, he's a very hard-nosed businessman. Um, he has a really big an agriculture community. And um, so these young salespeople would go out and they would try to sell using Bill Williams' name. So they would walk in and they would say, hey, I'm from, you know, um, ABC, you know, station. Uh, and oh, by the way, did you know it was owned by Bill Williams? And half the time they get thrown out of the office. <laughs> Or usually people would just listen and they would ultimately say no and they would go along. Well, what they didn't really understand was there's two groups of people in Wichita, people who know Bill Williams and hate him or people who don't know him yet. <laughs> or they were on the right side of his business deals and they liked him. So you either like Bill or you hate Bill. And so what was happening was people would would either tell people that it was a Bill Williams station, or when they were asked by the potential um, customer, hey, does Bill Williams own those stations? They would say, yes, he does. And they couldn't understand why they would keep getting thrown out. They thought it was a good thing. They didn't understand the impact of their answer. And so what we taught them to do was this. When somebody said, hey, does Bill Williams own that station? In that moment, they say, well, can I ask you, what do you think about Bill Williams? You sound like you know him. And, he, and the answer would either be, oh, I love Bill, or I hate that SOB. Well, now I, as a salesperson, know the potential impact of my answer. And my answer can be different depending on, on what the question. So, I, so if the guy said, well, I hate that son of a gun, I would say, if I was a salesperson, well, I understand that. But you know, should we spend a few minutes talking about that? And should I point out the fact that he really has absolutely nothing to do with the day-to-day -day operations? The operations are actually run by our operations manager, you know, Joe Smith. Or if they love Bill Williams, they can say, absolutely, Bill's one of our owners. And uh, you know, his influence is felt throughout our company. Two different answers, same question, different impacts. You have to be willing to get a question from somebody and reverse that and turn it into another question. But you can't blindly reverse it. When somebody says, why is the sky blue? You can't say, why did you ask me that? If somebody says, um, um, what is the, uh, what is your, what's the price of that home? You can't say, um, well, what do you mean? No, you can't. You can't do that. You have to learn how to soften and then reverse. Um, you know all those great questions that we ask? We ask people, what's the location? We ask them, what's the motivation? We ask them whether they've been working with an agent. We ask them if they've been, what's their buying power, if they've set a budget, et cetera, right? Those are all great questions, but you need to learn to nuance those questions in. And that's the way we use softening statements and reversing questions. Now, keep in mind, this little chart I have here is just a little sampling of potential softening statements and potential reversing questions. Okay? The reality is there's many, many, many more. But um, let's look at these things. What I try to do is I try to combine them together. If I'm going to reverse somebody, I need to learn how to soften my reverse. Unfortunately, a lot of people out there in the world and a lot of salespeople, once again, amateurs, they really only have one softening statement. And, that, and you hear them say, well, that's a good question. And so when you're sitting with an amateur salesperson, then you'll hear them say over and over again, well, that's a good question. Hey, that's a great question. You know, that's a really good question. And you hear it over and over again. It's a sure sign this guy's an amateur. I don't care if he's been in business for six months or 16 years. Because first of all, this is what I think. This is what goes through my head when I ask a salesperson a question and I say, hey, you know, um, how many miles does this have on this car? You know, that's a great question. I'm thinking to myself, well, hell yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Why don't you just answer the son of a gun? I don't need any of your flowery BS language. Just tell me how many miles is on the stinking car. You don't need to placate me and blow smoke up my butt by telling me it's a good question. So here's the deal. We need to use softening statements. Sometimes we need to use them to give us time to think. You need to learn a lot of softening statements. You need to learn and increase your sales vocabulary. You need to say things like, you know, a lot of people ask me that, or, hey, that's a great question, or, you know, help me understand, um, or, you know, I appreciate that, or, um, hey, you know, I don't get asked that a lot, or, um, you know, I'm glad you asked me just now, or good point, or, you know, thanks for asking me that. 
Um, it's a whole lot different if you say, well, how many miles are on that car? And you say, you know what? You know, I'm not sure about that. Uh, thanks for asking me that. Let me check that real quick. I go and I look. I say, hey, that's 168,000 miles. Hey, I'm curious. What kind of mileage miles are you looking for in the next car that you buy, the next used car you buy? Because now that I told him it was 168, was he looking for one with 80? Was he hoping it was 75? Was Did he think it was 120? What's the impact of my answer? I got to get more information. Sometimes I have to give a little bit to get a little bit. See, once again, it's all about getting more information to know when to close. See, until I get the information I need, I can't close you. I have a process. That house that you saw with those with those different floors, I have a process. I'll give you an example. Somebody calls me the other day, and they say, hey, Mark, um, um, I heard about your program. I want to get in your program. I really want you, quite frankly, just to take my money. I just want to get in your program. And a lot of you would be like, well, hell, that's the easiest sale ever. Well, it wasn't real hard, <laughs> but I have a process. And my process is I need to get certain information before I close a deal. And that information was, well, hey, I appreciate that. But before I just go take your money, I'm not sure I want it yet, by the way. Can I ask you a few questions to see if there's a good fit between you and my company? See, I've softened it. I got permission. And now I'm asking them, I'm going to ask her a bunch of questions. And then my next question was, could you tell me a little bit about your team, about what's going on over there and why you think it might be a good idea that we work together? I, I reversed and I started to get a whole bunch more information and I start putting the pieces together to find out whether or not this is a good potential client for me. I didn't just answer her. I also have a rule that I live by in the sales world and that says a positive prospect rarely is. People can't stay positive. They're eventually going to have a bunch of questions. They're going to want to know a bunch of stuff. So why don't we just get what's really going on out and we can deal with it out in the open. That's a whole nother class though. OK, so well, if I were you, I would take a copy of this chart <laughs> and I would put it um, somewhere, snapshot it or something. And I would put it up in my um, office, in my cubicle, by my computer so I could remember lots of softening statements and lots of reversing questions. Um, let's look at it in practice. Let's look at this um, objection, something you might hear on a uh, um an internet call. You might call somebody and say, hey, you know, um, this is Mark Benefield from uh, um, ksrealestate.com. Um, I noticed you were recently on our website looking at some properties. Um, I want to thank you for that. Um, and uh, I just wanted to know if I might be able to learn a little bit more about your, uh, your home search, about your buying situation. And they may say, oh, well, we're just looking. Well, in that moment, what you do next makes a big deal. Because are you going to go, um, 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 are you going to have confidence? Are you going to be assertive? Are you going to get your question in? And how are you going to do it? You're just going to blatantly hit them with a question like, what are you looking for? Or, um, so are you a buyer? Um, you know, do you, do you got a house you need to sell first? No, man, you can't just ask questions like that rapid fire right between their eyes. You got to be able to soften it. Um, another term we use is often um, acknowledge and ask, acknowledge and ask. In this case, we're going to acknowledge, we're going to use a softening statement and then a reversing question. So in this case, the person is just looking and I'll say, hey, that's good to hear. I acknowledge it, that I heard them. Second thing is I'm going to use a softening statement. You, you, you definitely should, should thoroughly look before you buy. Now, here comes my reverse. Out of curiosity, what type of homes are you looking for? So the guy says, just looking, hey, I, I understand that. You, you absolutely should thoroughly look before you buy anything. You should really think that process through. Just out of curiosity, what type of home are you looking for? Because there's just looking as a response, which is go away, leave me alone. And then it's a simple statement of we're just looking. Well, fine. Let me help you maybe navigate my website, and I can help you find what you're looking for. Right? Here's another one. Here's another um, acknowledge softening statement reverse for the same question or the same statement slash question, whatever. Hey, we're just looking. Well, hey, I appreciate that. You know, a lot of people that I've helped when I first met them were just looking just like you. Hey, I'm curious, if you had a magic wand, when would you be uh, looking to uh, be in your new home? 
Or when would you be looking to buy? Once again, in the red, acknowledge, softening statement, reversing question, right? I need to ask more questions. This isn't scripted because I don't know what they're going to say. This isn't an objection handler. This is a authentic question. You know what? I've worked with a lot of people that when they first came to our site, they were just looking. They saw a house on Facebook. They clicked on it. They came to our site. They wanted to see the picture. They thought it was cool. But back in their mind, they're thinking to themselves, man, I would really like to have a house like that someday. Is that what's going on with you? Right? Be authentic. Be empathetic. Connect with your customer. Right? Use those little third-party stories. You know, a lot of people I talk to are just like you. They clicked on something on Facebook and it came to our page and they had to register. They weren't really 100% serious, but they were curious. I'm just, I'm just wonder. I mean, if you could wave a magic wand and you could get in your house, a new home, when would that be? Three months, six months, 12 months? See, this is about being a professional. An amateur sees that just looking and they see it as an objection to be handled. I see it as an opportunity to dig deeper, find more about my customer and bond and connect. That's the difference between the amateur and the professional. Let's hear Let's, let's look at another one. Um, somebody might say something like this. Um, well, you know, we just don't think our credit's good enough right now. Hey, that's very common. Acknowledge it. You know, I've also, you know, had many clients that, you know, when I first, uh, um, when I first met them, um, they find out that their credit is actually better than they thought, you know, after speaking to a mortgage lender. Acknowledge, soften, hit them with the reverse. Have you taken the first steps to speak with a lender to understand your buying power? It's a lot better question than simply starting out with, you know, what's your budget? That's an amateur move, man. Come on, you're better than that, right? Hey, I've worked with a lot of people, and the first time I talked to them, they thought they, they, they didn't realize what their credit was. They didn't realize how close they were. Use a great third-party story. You know, hey, I just recently had a, a buddy of mine who refinanced his house with a less than 600 credit rating. Some people think that they're a lot further away than they really are, and they may only be 5, 10, 15, 20 points away. They may only be six months when they think they're 18. When's the last time you spoke with a lender? Because people don't know. Another one might be, hey, you know, I appreciate you sharing that with me. Did you know that there are many loan programs um, that are available, you know, with very different credit requirements? I mean, we have a great in-house lender. You know, if I could just have a couple of minutes, I could get some basic information. We could start that ball rolling to see if we might help you. Would that be of interest to you? Acknowledge it. Soften it. Use the reverse. Get more information. Take them to the next step. Lead by example. That's the difference between an appointment that peters out and somebody getting hit with a couple of questions and not knowing where to go. And once again, it's not about handling it. It's about authentically offering assistance to deal with what's going on. How can I help you? And what and the message is subconsciously is how do I help you work with me? How do I work with you? How do I connect? You see, people bond with people that are like them. People trust people that are like them. I need to walk in their shoes. I need to be empathetic. I need to use the right tonality. I need to be able to nuance and nurture my questions into existence and get people to connect with me at a different level. That's what makes me good at what I do, and I'm guessing that's what will make you good at what you do as you use more and more and more of your life experience to answer questions that you get or small you know, objections or statements that you hear, right? Our credit is not good enough is not necessarily an objection or a statement, a negative statement. It may actually be a question. When I hear somebody say our credit is not good enough, what I hear somebody saying is I would like to do something but I don't think I can. That's what I'm hearing. I may even say that. 
I may even say, well, you know, uh, Mary, I appreciate you sharing that with me. But a lot of times, you know, I deal with a lot of people just like you. And a lot of times when I hear our credit isn't good enough, what I hear is, man, I'd really like to get into a new house. But I just don't think financially we're in that right spot yet. But I don't really know. So does it make sense at that point to help them get in front of a lender to find out? Absolutely it does. See this um, um, this slide here? This is what we use called the Select Homes Iceberg. And this is, this is how we dig for pain with people. You see, finding people's connection to a problem, it doesn't just happen overnight. When somebody says they want to move to El Segundo, that's not enough. When you ask them, what's your location that you want to move to? And they say, well, I want to move to Andover, Kansas. You can't just leave it lay there. The amateur does that. The amateur goes to the next question, which is, right, well, um, you know, um, what's your price? What do you look, you know, what's your budget? Amateur does that. The professional is going to say, hey, help me understand. Could you be specific? Why did you guys pick out Andover? Or if you know that particular community and you know a lot of people move there because of the schools, right, because they have very good schools. There are lots of good sports. You may say something like, well, help me understand. You know, I talk to a lot of people, and sometimes when they say they move to Andover because they're really interested in the schools or maybe some specific sports teams, is that maybe why you're thinking about moving there? And they say, absolutely. And I say, well, which one? And they say, well, my son plays football. Oh, what position does he play? Oh, he's a tight end. Well, tell me more about that. I mean, how important is that to you guys to find a home in that area? And they say, well, it's really important. Well, how long have you been thinking about that? I mean, is this something that's brand new? Have you guys been planning this for a while? Is it, or is it just now coming up? I mean, you know, help me understand. Softening statement. Help me understand. Right. And I, I use questions like these one first level questions, second level questions, and third level questions. See those dotted lines. Eventually I get down there. Well, how long have you guys been thinking about that? We've been thinking about this song. Well, what else have you done? I mean, have you have you begun to work with an agent? Ooh, that's one of those LP mama questions, isn't it? Are you working with an agent? But see, I just I just move, man. I just weave that sucker right in there. Well, what else have you guys done besides on our website? I mean, have you guys, you know, taken the step to contact an agent and begin to start looking at homes in earnest or just really, really early on in your process? Oh, well, well, we're, you know, we're pretty far down the road. We've been really, well, we're going to make this happen. We're really looking. Great. Let me ask you this. Um, how important is it to you that you get to the end of our area? And oh, by the way, by the way, when do you need to be there? Right. I can nuance these questions and then we can have a fantastic peer to peer um, neutral tonality conversation. And the whole time I'm gathering information, the more I know about you, the less I have to sell you. The more I know about you, the softer my clothes can be. Because once I find out that you need to move to Andover because you got kids in school and you want to be on, you want your son to play on that football team. And oh, by the way, it's a closer to work and you've been working on this for six months and it's really important. You want to get there by the end of the school year. Guess what? I'm coming in for clothes now. I'm coming in to set the appointment. I say, well, Bill, um, you know, based on what you just told me, can I make a suggestion? Said, yeah, you know, it sounds to me like you guys are really far down that road. You're really in a position at this point where it really starts to make sense working with an agent. We probably um, need to ask you a few more questions about, um, you know, the financial status and make sure you're pre-approved and things like that. But we'll get to that in a moment. Um, does it make sense for you to be able to get from where you are today to get in the school system, to get your son ready for summer workouts before that starts? Um, does it make sense for us to sit down with the agent so we can help you, blah, 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 blah. See, I can't close it until I find out what their pain is. The only way I find out what their pain is is by being a professional, nuancing my questions, using softening statements, using reverses, getting in between those questions. That's how I become a professional. That's how I go from um, this side of the dummy curve, past the amateurs where all these other 
hundreds of real estate agents and thousands of ISAs are to his professional face. Because trust me, when you make a phone call to an expired or a FISBO, you're not the only person calling an expired FISBO that day. You can't do what everybody else does. You can't say what everybody else says. You need to connect with them at a different level. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to ask really good questions. And you're going to find your spot. And then you're going to use a great closing lines that we provide for you or you already have. And you're going to put all that together and your closing ratio is going to go up. Work on the skills that tie everything together. Work on your tonality. Work on how you carry yourself on the phone. Work on how you respect yourself and respect your client. It will come through. The words you say won't be near as much as how you sound. And when you do speak, make sure you're, what's coming out of your mouth is a question, not telling somebody what they should do. There is a time to make that suggestion. There is a time to tie it together and close it, but only after you found out what their emotional connection to this problem is and you took the time to dig a little bit deeper. Use that um, um, iceberg technique that I showed you. Use softening statements and, and expand your vocabulary. Become on the road to be professional. There's no embarrassment in being over here in the dummy phase. And you're always going to have a little bit of curve, but will your curve be this low or will it be all the way down here and you have to dig yourself out of it? You know what? We can even this thing out a whole bunch if we get outside of ourselves, outside of our head, outside of our comfort zone and realize that, you know what? I need to become a really good question asker and a lot less objection handler you're going to go a whole lot further in this world that we call sales and inside sales. So I want to thank all of you all very much for uh, your time and attention today. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I look forward to working with you guys when you get to the uh, advanced phase. Have a fantastic day. Good selling and uh, go out there and knock them dead. Thanks a lot, everybody.